explain your book, Flight of the Rondoni, or maybe before that, just explain a little bit about who you are and what your background is. Okay. Uh, I'm originally from the south side of Chicago. I uh, grew up in an uh, Italian enclave, basically, you know, 5,000 away, miles away from Italy. Um, and uh, we have 13 brothers and sisters, uh, basically, with half-brothers, step-brothers, and et cetera. But for me, they were always all my brothers and sisters. Uh, lived the American dream. Um, first, I was in trouble. Uh, Judge Clarence Bryant sent me to the military when I was 16. I couldn't go into any uh, military but the Air Force because they were the only ones who had what was called the late enlistment program. So uh, uh, my mother signed, uh, and I went into the Air Force when I turned 17. I got out when I was like 19 because uh, my mother needed help at home, so I got a hardship discharge, which is an honorable discharge. And uh, I started working on the docks in Chicago. A friend of mine needed uh, someone to take a job as a runner at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, and it ended up being me. Uh, a couple of years later, I was uh, a guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show as a Rags to Riches story. Uh, later, I was a guest on her show again as American, uh, a famous American chauvinist. I was in Playgirl magazine uh, with... Uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone and Magic Johnson as uh, one of America's most eligible bachelors in 89, I believe it was. And uh, I got married. My oldest son was diagnosed with a very rare blood disease in uh, 92, October. And I dropped everything and threw my life into uh, trying to cure sickle cell disease and thalassemia, which is the disease that my son has. And the reason I say both of those diseases is because they're both... Um, defects on the beta globin gene. So you cure one, you cure them both. And there's 100,000 sickle cell disease patients in the U.S. There's only 2,500 thalassemic patients. Our, a mutual friend of ours, Art Williams, the counterfeiter, put us in touch. How did you meet Art? Yeah, Art's from my neighborhood as well. My brother Georgie, God rest his soul, hung around with Art, you know, and our kids. And uh, Art's a typical neighborhood guy. Um, just like I tend to believe I'm a typical neighborhood guy. You know, it's a blue collar enclave um italian mostly and irish uh, predominantly um uh, back then especially and uh you know he said hey i got this uh, nice guy danny i want to put him in touch <laughs> he's got this good show and i think you're made for it and of course my book flight of the rondone um you know is just hit uh the stores uh, three or four days ago you can get it on amazon and bam and here it is and uh, flight of the rondone and of course, if nobody reads the book, it doesn't do anybody any good. How, what started you on on this journey from like what w was your early life like? Like you were born where? Yeah, so I was born on the south side of Chicago uh, <clears throat> to an Irish father, an Italian mother. Uh, but I grew up in, the, in an Italian neighborhood because the, my father was never around. And that night, I don't remember how old I was. He said he wasn't my father. I mean, I really don't care about all that nonsense. Um, but I do have my mother's maiden name. Uh, I lived a wonderful life. You know, I, I love it how people, you know, everybody wants to whine and complain and cry today. You know, woe is me, whether it's a special interest group called Me Too or Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ. You know, it's all about, oh, woe is me, woe is me, we're discriminated against and all of that. Well, all of us, every single one of us has heart, hardship, heartbreak, etc. And I'm one of the believers that the hardship and heartbreak is what make us who we are. And I'm very lucky and fortunate and happy that on the south side of Chicago, I had a lot of experiences stealing cars and, um, you know, uh, stores and whatever I did to, you know, make ends meet. And I'm happy about it. I'm happy who I am. I'm glad there was nothing hard about it. I got beat up a bunch of times, shot at, you know, I was, a uh, you know, part of a FBI and three FBI investigations, you know, I mean, but in the end, it's not woe is me. I mean, lucky me that I went through all these great experiences and I am who I am. And uh, my life has just been wonderful and continues to be wonderful. And I'm saying that, you know, the father of a child who in 1992, they said wouldn't make it to be 14 years of age, he would die and he would live a horrible existence. And you know, uh, I can say that it, it, it was a wonderful life and it is a wonderful life. And um, luckily my son, because of experimental medicine and other uh, advances, today is 32. He owns a restaurant. He's a great, great young man. Um, but yeah, I mean, adversity. I mean, it, 
you know, I, I, I get crazy. I, yesterday I was reading an article where schools are going to start, you know, giving grades to kids that they consider darker skin than the others. They're going to give them extra points on their grades to try to make up for <laughs> discriminations of the past. No, I mean, it's just insanity. I have no idea where these people come from. If I had a tougher background growing up, I've actually got the advantage, not the disadvantage. So I come from mm -hmm. a family. There wasn't a lot of cake. You know, a lot of fighting, shooting. 10% of my neighbor was in jail, for crying out loud. Well, are we all whining and saying, poor, woe is me? No. We were lucky that we grew up like that. You know, we had a lot of different experiences that other people that weren't as lucky to get those experiences. So everybody, you know, I say they played a woe is me card. For me, it's the opposite. I was lucky. You know, I mean, and, and this idea of now balancing the act out because we mistreated, you know, uh, homos or we mistreated uh, dark-skinned people or we mistreated uh, the handicapped, wh whatever it is. I mean, I, I think it's kind of these social experiment, experiments are kind of great for the big corporations and all that. But I yeah. think they're, you know. They're great for corporations crazy. and politicians. Yeah, I mean, but it, it's just ripping the country apart. It's just I've never seen anything so ridiculous. I mean, if I went back to Italy and told the Italians that they were white, they'd look at me like I was nuts. Like, what are you talking about? And especially in Italy where, you know, you go into Calabria, Sicily, Puglia, you know, a lot of our people are darker skinned than the Northern Africans. And then if you go up to Trieste in Northern Italian, you have bluer eyes than the Germans. I mean, like, what is all of this nonsense? And then, you know, I read the other day, I mean, Bill Cosby's going back to court for something supposedly he did in 1975. I mean, how do you defend yourself? He's about, free, isn't he? Well, he's free, but now they're going after him again because a woman said she's 62 right? years old. That's exactly right. She's 62. It's a civil case this time, but it's all about money, of course. But, you know, she's 62 and claims that Bill Crosby in, Crosby in 1975 took her to his hotel or his home and put his hand in her pants and made her touch him. And she's going after money, and Bill Cosby is going to be back in court. He doesn't have to show up, but of course, you know he'll have to pay the money if he's he's condemned. But what are they nuts? I mean, <laughs> how does a, a man or a woman defend themselves about something that happened more than two or three years ago, let alone forty-seven years ago? I mean, is this getting even? You know, for all of these poor women who, at one time or another, were abused. And don't get me wrong. Women are abused, men are abused, dogs are abused, cats are abused. Everybody's abused. But, I mean, what does this do, putting people in jail and, and making them give up their money? I mean, it's just, it's insanity. Yeah, it's a weird it's a weird thing, especially when there's high-level high celebrities like Bill Cosby or well, John. Well, because he's got money. They're right. not going to go after, a, the, you know, I mean, it, it could have a guy living on the street. He's homeless, and maybe he molested 400 women in his days. But they're not going to go after him because he ain't got no money. Right, right. Or Johnny Depp. Did you watch the whole Johnny Depp debacle? You know, I didn't watch it all. I mean, it's all kind of... I mean, again, I live in Italy for the most part. Um, I am a proud American. I served in the American military. I have a, a, a honorable discharge and all of that. And I'll die a proud American. Catholic, by the way. Um, but, you know, I, I have my three sons. They live in Italy. I live in Italy most of the year. Oh, they all live in Italy. That's yeah, cool. they all live in Italy. And, um, you know, because of my son's disease, I mean, we ended up there because he was supposed to do... Uh, experimental medicine and here he had to be hospitalized and it cost me like 70 grand for 40 days um so Fuck. i ended up opening up a uh, a medical center uh, in a town 20 miles from my grandparents town and uh we ended up there because of that because he could do the medicine at home and because instead of like 70,000 for 40 days i mean it cost me like 3,000 you know what is the difference in the medical system there versus here well this brief interruption is brought to you by Versus Game. And this week's Versus Game question of the week is, will Steph Curry score more than 30 points in Game 6 of the NBA Finals? Go vote yes or no. Versus Game, one word, no spaces. Or click the link below or search for Concrete on the Versus Game app. Go do it now and win some money. Back to the show. You know, I mean, it's, oh, this, this could go way over, you know. And uh, so... At one time, the health care in the United States was a service. And today, it's an industry. You know, at one time, when I was a kid, my mother would take me and my brothers and sisters. We'd go see Dr. Farrell. If she had 20, she gave him a 20. <laughs> if she had 10, she gave him a 10. Every year, to go into Catholic schools, you had to be checked out. 
So you'd go with her, and you'd get done. And Dr. Farrell, whatever my mother had, you know, he spent his 15 minutes, filled out the papers. We went to school. Everybody was happy. Because medicine was a vocation about taking care of sick people. Today, as we know, the corrupt orations own a great part of the health care, and they've infiltrated our not-for-profits. I mean, you have places like Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, which, don't get me wrong, it's a great place. The CEO makes $6.7 million salary a year. And then when a kid dies of cancer, you know, they ask the grandparents if they can donate $50 for the Easter egg hut. I mean, are they out of their minds? But this is where health care is gone. It's basically, you know, we we watch on television. You know, I think it was 1997 when the FDA finally allowed us to advertise on television. We're the only ones, by the way, that do that. So now they not only advertise, you know, all of these drugs for if you've got your legs move at night or bul- I, the other day I saw one for bulging eyes. I mean, and then they tell you about the defects, which are right. worse than, you know, than, than, the, than the problem that you have. And this is the corrupt orations that took over the country. I heard somewhere that we are one of like one of two countries on earth that actually allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise. Yes, New Zealand, New but Zealand. New Zealand don't al- don't allow it the way that we allow it. I mean, we have it direct, you know. We have, you know, I cancer uh, firm of America, you know, it saved my life and uh, you know, they told me that I was going to die when I went over to the XYZ cancer firm and I went over here and then they told me I was going to live and here I am, I'm dancing. I mean, it's just I mean, it's just insanity, um, but they own the country. I mean, look at this LGBTQ stuff. I mean, I mean, does do people realize why the transgender thing is becoming so big? Well, it's because it co- it's twelve thousand dollars a month to do the hormonal treatment. So of course you've got these corporations pushing kids to become transgenders. It's about money. It's about the innervations. You know, I mean, I read the other day that, you know, these uh, testosterone and estrogen, et cetera, went from being products that 20 years ago were selling, you know, $20 million worth to selling two or $3 billion worth. It's not that our kids want to become girls or boys anymore. That It's just that they're being pushed into those things by big pharma. And uh, it's, it's, it's criminal. I mean, they're, child molesters or child abusers i mean it's just insanity insanity wow i didn't know i did not know that 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 was the cost of this the sort of therapy for oh yeah and, and if you talk about these these operations you know they're mutilating their bodies men are t- cutting t- cutting off their penises women are taking skin from their <clears throat> their arms and and making and they're never penises by the way and a man is always a man he's got xy chromosomes and he's a man i mean they could say whatever they want but a giraffe even if it wants to be a turtle is still a giraffe and it's just <laughs> insanity that you know and don't get me wrong i don't care what people do in their bedroom they want to you know puck you know they want to pack fudge they want to <laughs> I don't. I don't really care what they do. It's none of my business. I love them anyway. By the way, mm-hmm. um, but you know this whole idea that we're taking kids and giving them all of these horrible drugs that are doing nothing good for them, and trying to say that this is right, we're saving their lives, which is really insane. Because how many suicides are created? And then you have them doing the detransgendering. You know they're going back after that, like. 14% of them. I mean, it is, that is what it is? 14% of them well, go back? Well, they claim up to 7 to 14, but a lot there's not a lot of good statistics for all of this stuff because it's all brand new. Yeah. But the other day I was reading, and they call them, and I apologize that I, I, I forgot exactly, but it's called, they, what do they call it? When you go from one way to the other, they call it transgendering, not transgendering. There's transitioning? Another, transitioning. <laughs> then they have detransitioning. Right. I made a mistake. You know, 14 years ago, I thought I wanted to be a man. Now I really want to be a woman. And it's crazy. Guess what? You're born a man. That's what you are. I'm sorry, but you got to play with the cards that you're dealt. Mm. And I'm not saying you can do whatever you want. I mean, <clears throat> you know, when I was a kid, you know, I mean, I, I, I was freaking 15, 14 years old. I was with a 25-year-old waitress for like a year and a half. I mean, okay, you know, who cares? You know, it was one of the best years and a half of my life. I learned more from that woman than I learned from 10 or 20 women. You know, today they'd want to put her in jail. I think you ought to give her a medal. <laughs> I think they ought to give you a medal. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, there are some people that would like to do that, uh, but probably in the form of a bullet. But And, and that's okay, too. But In because, the form of a bullet? Well, you know, look it. Uh, Why would they want to do that? Big Pharma. 
you know, I mean, doesn't like you. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I, I fought, you know, a company. They were a $12 billion company in 2018. Uh, their CEO was voted the CEO of the year in 2014. He made $24 million alone in 2018. In 2020, he was voted the worst CEO in the United States. And the company today has a market cap of around $300 million. What company was this? Bluebird Bio. Bluebird Bio. And uh, I started my lawsuit in 2015, not knowing anything, by the way, but just wanted to get my product back rolling. And I just didn't understand what the hell was going on. And uh, had they known that I was eventually going to last that long, they'd have killed me like they kill so many people. You know, we, we have the uh, couple, for example, that owned Apotech in Canada. They killed them about three years ago. I forget their exact names. Nobody ever figured out A who they were. A company in Canada called yeah, Apotech? Apotech, yeah, and the owners were... Can't, you know they were they were killed i mean at one time it was i think 2019 i was at home and i i get a, this weird call and it says uh watch michael clancy i'm like what the fuck is this i don't even know what michael clancy is you know and then i go and i look at the movie it was a movie and it's about a guy who's going against the corrupt orations and uh you know, they hold him down and they give him phosphate in between the toes so he gets heart attack, you know. And I actually, my book, it's in my book, I wrote letters right then to my children. I said, look, wow. at it, if I get killed by the mafia or run over by a car or have a heart attack, that's not what happened. You know, I'm pissing a lot of people off. And uh, most of these people are these huge corrupt orations, I call them. And I call the CEOs, the modern CEOs, crazed, egotistical opportunists and that's just what they are mm -hmm. and they they're destroying the country how old was your son when he got diagnosed with sickle cell so he was diagnosed with thalassemia which is causing di disease of sickle cell so arabs and orientals get thalassemia basically and southern italy is arab for the most part you know de genetically speaking and um he was uh, two and a half years old in 1992 october and uh, they told me that he would die by the time he was 14. He'd have to do transfusions every month or a couple of months, and uh, it would be a horrible existence. I was lucky enough to do um, experimental medicine with a wonderful professor from the University of San Francisco. She today is at BU, Boston University, named Susan Perrine. And um, in order to avoid transfusions, because back in the early 90s, there was no antibodies recognized yet for hepatitis C and AIDS, so anybody who did a transfusion, you know, it was like Russian roulette. Um, so I Oof. didn't want to transfuse him. So we did experimental medicine, and thank God, for about five, six years he was on that. And uh, it maintained his hemoglobin from where he would have been at six, six and a half, seven, to nine, ten. And so he was able to avoid a hundred different transfusions at a time where you really needed to avoid them. What were the signs? What were you seeing? What was going on with him? Like, what made you question something's up? So... Um, when we're in our mother's womb and up to about a year and a half, we have what's called um, gamma globin gene, uh, and it's the fetal hemoglobin. The hemoglobin transports oxygen all over our bodies, and then when we get to be about a year and a half, that turns off, and the adult hemoglobin turns on, and that's the beta globin gene. The problem with sickle cell disease and, beta and thalassemic patients is that they have a defective beta globin gene or human adult hemoglobin gene. So as a consequence, I mean, these poor sickle cell disease patients, which is slightly different because they also have a problem that their blood cells sickle in shape and they get these horrible strokes and, and the pain. And, and, it, and by the way, it's mostly ignored in the United States. And a lot of the reason it's ignored is because there's so much money in treating the 100,000 patients that are out there. You know, they, they estimate that there's, a, you know, a, it costs $150,000 a year for all of these hemoglobin or all of these sickle cell disease and thalassemic patients. So there isn't always a big push to get a cure. The same thing in cancer. And I'm certainly not trying to say, you know, oh yeah, you know, they've got a cure to everything. And, and it, it, that's not the case. But as was said about me uh, back in the 2000s by one of the top um, CEOs uh, back then, I, I believe was Celgene. And he said, Gerandi, he can't be that uh, intelligent. He's trying to cure a disease. The money's in treating him. You said that you got you took him to a, a special hospital in uh, San Francisco, and uh, they started treating your son. Yeah. What happened next? Sure. So, um, I, I at the time was in Germany. Uh, you know, because the markets were go 
excuse me, we're going electronic. I traded on the floor of the New York or the Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Board Option Exchange. I had memberships, New York Stock Exchange, et cetera. But at that time, things were going electronic. I realized that I was in Germany for a deal. And uh, I got a call from my uh, uh, my son's mother, and she said, look, at Rocco's not moving. You know, he's like, he's tired, and he's, he's, he's very pale, you know, pale. And I said, well, take him in, you know, take him to his pediatrician, see what's going on. And he said, he's got thalassemia and um so i looked it up and miles of facts came in because back then the internet wasn't so easy to get all of the articles about hematology and in fact he had thalassemia we were told that he would die by the time he was 14 and that he needed to transfuse immediately i didn't want to do that so we ended up in san francisco and he did experimental medicine then because we didn't want to do it we didn't want to be hospitalized and we couldn't afford to keep him doing the experimental medicine in uh, california we moved uh, to italy forever basically and opened up a medical center and he did it there um uh, slowly but surely um there were other uh, disease or other um, what made you want to move to italy what told you that Italy? you know what was the what influenced that decision well first of all uh, you know i was growing up in italian i mean uh, my i grew up in an italian neighborhood um you know, Italian was the, you know, second language. And um, when I made money, I went to Italy, visited my grandparents' people and uh, my mother's people, and I loved it. And it was just, you know, a great place to be. And then when uh, my son was doing the experimental medicine in, in the hospital in San Francisco, uh, I decided he couldn't live like that. I mean, I wanted to avoid the transfusions, but I couldn't afford you know, whatever it was, 70000 for 40 days, and I didn't want him hospitalized. So we decided, and Italy has a, a, a more liberal kind of attitude about medicine in a lot of ways, and he didn't need to be hospitalized to do it there. So we moved 20 miles from my grandparents' house. I opened up a medical center, and we started treating a lot of patients, 38 patients at one time we had on, in 1997, 1998, on arginine and isobutyramide. That seems like a crazy thing. I just opened a medical center. That seems like a big undertaking. Like, how, how did that, what made you want to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, like any other parent, you, you're going to do whatever you can do for your child. Yeah. I mean, there are some exceptions, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I guess they're not, not all our great parents. But like any normal parent, um, I don't consider myself any different. I want to do the best I was I could, and I was lucky. Like I told you, I was on Oprah Winfrey for Rags to Riches, so I had cake, you know, and I could afford to do it. And um, I didn't want my son hospitalized, so I said, what's my alternative? I'll bring him to Italy where he doesn't need to be hospitalized. He can live a more normal life. And I wanted to help others, and I wanted to push ahead to research. So I started a company in 1993. From 1995 to 2004, I was partners with John Walton of Walmart. I mean, really, John, great guy. He died in 2005, I believe. But John and his wife had a son, Lucas, who, thank God, today is 34. Um, he had a horrible disease called Wilms tumor. They wanted to cut off half of his lungs. Um, but we had, in arginine butyrate, an application for Wilms tumor. So the Walton family uh, invested like $20 million with me. You know, they invested $20 million and took over our project, and we were... Partners from 1995 to 2004 in Beacon Pharmaceuticals. And then uh, John said, look, at, um, his son actually went to Mexico and, uh, you know, ate herbs and did all of these uh, kind of holistic things that never took out his lung and is a healthy man today. Um, and John called me up one day. I was on the trading floor in Chicago, and he said, Pat, you know what? My son is doing fine, and I want you to go help little Rocco. I'm going to give you Beacon. Just like that. $20 million, All of the patents we had in there. He gave it to me. Just like that. Just handed you the whole entire company. Just that. And um, I was negotiating with Memorial Sloan Kettering because I knew that gene therapy would cure my son and sickle cell disease. Thalassemia is my son's disease. I knew it. When you say gene therapy, what exactly do you mean? So when we talk about gene therapy for us, we basically take the HIV virus and we disarm it. So now it's an empty school bus. And we put the gene that we want to get into the patient, the defected gene, in our case, the beta globin gene. And we make a bunch of school buses with a bunch of beta globin genes in them. 
Then we take stem cells from the patients and we incubate them with the beta globin gene, which is in the school bus. This is called a lentiviral vector, the HIV vector. It gets into the stem cells and we give them back to the patient. He or she is asymptomatic. They're cured. And there's been almost 100 people now cured that way. What, cured with no recurrences of anything? Yes. No I symptoms mean, or anything? For four or five, six years. We actually treated three patients <clears throat> from 2012 to 2015 with Memorial Sloan Kettering using our product. And two out of three of those patients, after nine years, have reductions in transfusions of 43%. Now, having said that, that product was made in 2009. Today, if we make that product, which we're making it now at the University of Tennessee and Southern Illinois University with uh, doctors uh, Andy Wilbur and uh, Frank Park, uh, Christopher Ballas, um, these are our people, we're going to cure our patients. Wow, that's fascinating. And so what currently are you doing with your medical center in Italy? My medical center in Italy is my son's restaurant. We oh, now it's a restaurant. Yeah, we closed the medical center when he no longer could do the experimental medicine. When he couldn't, you know, be hooked up to this pump, you know, with all of this copious amounts of water going into him for uh, 16 hours a day or whatever it was. We be and Holy they shit. discovered, you know, the antibodies for AIDS and hepatitis C. So our blood, you know, our blood is infinitely more secure today. Mm -hmm. So my son still transfuses every 20 days. He does iron chelation. And we closed the, the uh, medical center because it wasn't needed any longer for that. And uh, today he has a restaurant inside of it. So he does a blood transfusion every how many days? 20 days. 20 days. What is that like? Well, it's, uh, wow. I mean, there's no expression or uh, no words that can give you a real feeling of what it's like sitting there. I'm watching the kind of blood come out of this little plastic sack and going into your son's body. But it's a lifesaver. And um, there are a lot of people that have it a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. I can't imagine what that must be like to have to do that every 20 days. Think of the sickle cell disease patients who luckily my son doesn't go through the horrible, horrible strokes. And, I mean, kids even mm. five, six, seven years old, just excruciating pain because their red blood cells are sickling and blocking up their veins and their capillaries and just <clears throat> unimaginable pain. And there's no way to know when they're going to come. And <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible. Um, and let's hope we're hoping we believe that the lentiviral vectors like ours need to have an insulator. Now, Bluebird Bio the company that sabotaged my product, actually, is trying to get approved. And the FDA will let them know shortly if they will or not be approved. They're asking $2.1 million per patient, which is ridiculous, by the way. Just ridiculous. And, you know, they, they uh, say, well, you know, sickle cell costs 150000 a year to treat a patient. So, you know, in 15 years, uh, we got our money back. That, that's not right. You know, the re then they'll try to say, well, it costs so much to make medicine. No, it doesn't. It costs so much to give the corrupt CEOs and the minions right. all of the money and all of the funds that are dishing all of the money out, you know, to get their money back and to do their pyramid schemes with the stock market. Yeah, that costs millions and billions maybe. But it's not that the research costs that kind of money. Yeah, and that's another thing. Uh, a lot of these Big pharmaceutical corporations, especially when you talk about companies like Pfizer or whatever, they have people working for them that are ex-FDA or former or people that are like wearing two hats. They work for the FDA and they work for the pharmaceutical company. Yeah, I mean, isn't that a huge problem? Well, it's a conflict of interest. I was on a show the other night and the guy was trying to rebut me a little bit. And he said, uh, well, wasn't it just a big conflict of interest? And I said, yeah, it, it was a conflict of interest. Bluebird Bio wanted to make more, wanted to make money more than they wanted to cure people, and that was the conflict. Um, but in the end, if we go back and look in our recent history, <clears throat> Vioxx, right, Merck, right, they knew that people on Vioxx had a multiple time more chance. I believe it was six to get heart attacks. 
than the people who didn't take Vioxx. Mm -hmm. And they let it go. <clears throat> they ended up being fined $950 million because they were caught red-handed. Mm. Then we go to Paxil, 2012. They were fined $3 billion. That was GSK. And GSK knew that Paxil was creating suicidal thoughts in adolescents, and they hit it. We had at least 100,000 kids commit suicide that came off of Paxil. And then we got the best one of them all, OxyContin, mm. the Sackler family, right. Purdue. And, you know, what is our government doing? They're letting them go. Yeah, why? Is, isn't there something recent in the news with them? Didn't they just have to, didn't they just? $4 billion are going to end up doing a deal, you know, because they basically told the government, if you go after us personally, right. you know, we're going to bank up Purdue. You're never going to get us anyway, but we'll give you $4 billion. So, you know, they're worth $14 billion. So they give $4 billion up. And they have the art institutes with their names on it and all of them. Right. They don't spend one day in jail. I mean, what's the pain of one parent, of one brother, sister, who lost a kid to OxyContin? They were making drug addicts out of these kids purposely. You know, we talk about the United States, which is a bit peculiar when we talk about the world, because we have all these mass shootings. Well, 70% of them are created by people under 21. Well, why are they doing that? Because they're on Paxil, because they were on Ritalin, right. because we're drugging our kids, and right. then when they're coming out of drugs, you know, they're, they don't know. I mean, they're just screwed up in the head, mm. and our drug companies are doing that to make all this money, and then what do they do? They get machine guns, they buy guns, whatever it is. I mean, I'm not a big NRI guy, but it is true that guns don't kill people do. I mean, I, I lived in Switzerland for a while. Every family must own a rifle because World War I, it, they made the law, and they it's have to It's a law have you have to own they a rifle. You have to own a rifle. Really? Sure. Still? Still. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and every person has to go to the military because it's a tiny country surrounded by Russia and Germany and Italy and France and all of that. They're not killing anybody. You know, what's going on? We're turning all of our kids, and by the way, our adults. I mean, I think, you know, the average 60-year-old's on seven different drugs. I mean, we're turning everybody into drug addicts. And yeah. uh, what are the pharma companies doing in the last 10 years? They siphon $20 billion to our politicians who let them get away with it. Mm. And in the end, I say, you know, we've got to make all of our congressmen and our senators, when they're on television and when they're in Congress and at the Senate, they've got to wear NASCAR outfits so we can see, see who's sponsors. writing the checks. You know, I want to see, oh, why did they vote that way? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, look at Pfizer gave them 100000 last year. You know, and I mean, the United States is a great place filled a wonderful, wonderful people. Is that George Carlin who said that? It might have been <laughs> whoever said it, but uh, it was a great thing. That was great, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, come on with all of this. I mean, you know, we're a great country. How do we let, you know, these corruptorations, and by the way, now they're hand in hand with Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. They're all just one happy family raping and pillaging the country. I mean, it's nuts. Yeah, yeah. A huge problem, too. Not just like the the, uh, the opiates are a huge problem, obviously, but another thing is the, the Ritalin and the Adderall are fucking insane. Yeah. I don't know... I could count on one hand the people I know that aren't on that. Yeah, they're, they're finding it in the in the in the uh, water supply. It's everywhere. I, I mean, it, I mean, it's nuts. And these people aren't going to jail; they're going to the country club. That stuff is so fucking bad for you. It's unbelievable how bad that shit is for you. That is not how you're supposed to. That, that it drains the fucking dopamine out of your brain to where if you don't have it. You're just a fucking blob of nothing, and then all you can think about is getting more. It's so fucking addictive and so bad. I think it's. I think there's not much difference from Adderall than actual meth, like pure meth. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, you know, look at we. You know, there's a great book I read one time. It was called Sykes, and he said that the the downfall of the United States of America came in 1959 when they opened Disney World. He said, because we came from a country that we knew we had to work hard, we had to get married, have children. Um, suffer, sacrifice, and die to a country who doesn't want to have children, doesn't want to sacrifice, will spend the last money not to die, and life's all about having a good time. And I say, for example, that the worst song ever made, now I'm a singer-songwriter, I've done a lot of good songs and bad songs, I'm not sure you'd like them all, but I always say the worst song ever made was done by Whitney Houston when she sang that the greatest love of all is happening to me Learn to love yourself. It's the greatest love of all. There's never been such a horrible song written. That's not what mm. it's about. 
It's about loving other people, mm. not loving yourself. You know, and then they started saying, well, if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. And all of these corporations are trying to sell you an iPhone and trying to sell you makeup and trying to sell you gym shoes. Love yourself. And, You're okay. You can, yeah. get, you can get fat. Yeah, you that, can be that's lazy. right. Yeah. We're going to make mannequins that look fat now. Yeah. And, and don't worry about it. You know, you put on 30 pounds, get a tattoo. You put on 60, get two tattoos. Exactly. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. It's nuts. You were dealt this hand. You're a man or you're a woman. You're a boy or you're a girl. You're bald or you're, you're, you've got freckles or you're dark-skinned or you're light-skinned <clears throat> or you were born with defective fingers or whatever. You're not a goddamn victim. You're a human being. Mm. And you end up having to play the best hand you can with the cards you were dealt. Stop all this nonsense. Oh, now I'm a woman. Or now I'm a man. No, you're not. You mutilated yourself, and you're nuts. Right. Um, going back, how did you get in trouble with the FBI? Uh, okay, so um, the first time in 1989, which is another reason why I ended up in Italy, uh, <laughs> Cargill, I think it was Cargill, went to the, no, Archer McDaniels maybe, went to the FBI, and they said, you know, we're getting ripped Who's off. Who's Archer McDaniels? There are this huge company that owns more farmland probably than anyone in the world. More than Bill Gates? Uh just kidding. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> um, anyway, there were some c complaints that at the Chicago Board of Trade, um, they were being ripped off. And the government decided to go infiltrate the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange with FBI agents who bought memberships, lied about their names, and it's hilarious. They actually bought memberships, and it's great because when you signed to buy a membership, it said that anything that you say must be the truth, and if not, you're breaking the law. Uh, so the FBI did that. And they infiltrated the exchange floors and they started getting people, trapping people, entrapment to break the rules. And uh, luckily for me, uh, I got a call and it was from a higher up guy, um, not in the FBI, but uh, in uh, the administration at the uh, Board of Trade in the Mercantile Exchange. And he said, Pat, uh, come to my office. I said, yeah. My firm, uh, Bridgeport Securities, we were like the largest soybean traders in the soybean option pit at the time. He said, the FBI is on the floor. And we had heard rumors about it, but the, the uh, president of the Board of Trade and the Merck denied that they were there. <clears throat> and so nobody kind of thought it was just rumors. I left the next day for Italy. <sighs> and in fact, they took one of the guys that worked for us. He actually didn't work for us. He was on our, pay he was on our company insurance, and he filled paper in the soybean pit. They went, into, went to his house at 3 o'clock at night, scared him, scared his kids, said, if you don't flip, you're going to go to jail, you'll lose your wife, she'll divorce you, you'll never see your kids. Um, and his name is Tom. I won't give his last name. He ended up going and doing five years in jail. His wife divorced him while he was in jail. Of course, he didn't see his kids. Um, and they got him for what was called bucket trading. Bucket was, trading? Yeah, it was a joke. So at the end of the trading day at 115, brokers would end up having – uh, orders to buy and sell. And if they were time stamped before one fourteen thirty, that broker had to fill that order. So it was a big risk for him. So he would walk around the pit and say, Hey Pat, I got to buy six. And we'd say, Oh, sold you six. We'd use the price of the close, but it was a way of transferring risk from the floor broker who for the most part didn't make a lot of money on tri on these, uh, commissions and we transferred the risk to traders trader groups like my own he ended up doing five years for it it was just a joke and uh, that was the first time i went to italy so my son was born in 90 uh, and then my second son in 91 um, the fbi made a bunch of phone calls to my office they didn't try to extradite me back then i think it would have been a more difficult and I was, like I said, I was on Oprah. I was in Playgirl magazine in 89. You know, they wanted a guy like me, a big fish. Um, what, were they what, what was Oprah talking to you about? Uh, Rags the Riches story. And uh, it was great. I, I didn't graduate from high school. I ended up one of the bigger traders, you know, in Chicago history. And uh, it was great. And, uh, you know, I remember she said, uh, um, when did you know, uh, you know, did you know when growing up that you do something big in life? And I said, well, yeah, I... I, I thought I might do something big. I didn't know if it would be legal. And, you know, she laughed, and that was cute and all of that. And then a couple of years later, I was back on there for famous American chauvinist because uh, 
I think it was uh, Janet Davies from ABC or somebody after I was in Playgirl said, you know, you want to get married? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, tell us what kind of a girl will you marry? And I said, well, I'd like her to be a virgin. Oh my God, the hate mail I got. And Oprah. why would you want to, what you said you really wanted to date a, a marry a virgin? Yes, I did. Really? Well, because what do you want to marry a porn star? I mean, you want to marry a hooker? I mean, I mean, there's a, th it's not one or the other. There's a, there's an in between there. Well, yeah. <laughs> but wouldn't you like a woman who has only ever been with you? Wouldn't a woman like a man who has ever only ever been with them? I mean, I would say no. Okay, but again, I would say you'd want somebody who had some experience, who knew what they were doing. Well, you know what? I think differently. I would have liked to have a woman who had only been with me. Okay. And maybe that was an old-fashioned idea. You know, a lot of times I use that maybe. thing. It died yeah. with the virgin, my, or the virgin bride. But, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm talking about me. Right. But because I said that, mm -hmm. it ended up, uh, it got me invited to Oprah Winfrey the second time as a famous American show. Oh, wow. That's what got you invited. Yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> That's what got me invited because, like I said, I was on Janet Davies' show, ABC. I can't remember what it was uh, for, um, you know, uh, famous uh, American bachelors. And uh, that's what got me on. Hmm. Wow. And, and you've been, and how long, and then when you moved there to Italy in 90, you said? Yeah. I, yes. <clears throat> uh, in 89, I left for a couple of years. And then we moved back. My son did experimental medicine. But because of that, we moved back to Italy and so basically what, cemented us there. So when you moved to Italy, you basically retired? No. I mean, I'm the, you know, I'm the founder of the pharmaceutical company, uh, San Rocco Therapeutics, uh, which is like my full-time thing. But I'm also singer-songwriter. But that started after when your after your son, son was born, born. which yes. was so. so I what went, was your plan when you moved to Italy? Yeah, so I went to Italy because I knew the markets were going electronic. So Europe had the first electronic markets. So mm. we were trading on the Sofix, which was the Swiss Options Futures Exchange, and the Eurex, which first was the Deutsche Terminbourse, and then the Eurex. So we were already invading Europe because we thought that it would go all go electronic. So we had American traders in Europe and going back and forth. Okay. And then when I found out in 89, so we already had operations there. Um, but then in 89, when we found out the FBI was entrapping people on the Chicago Board of Trade, I left because I knew they wanted a guy just like me. Mm. And I, there's nothing good you can do for anyone when the FBI questions you. You're not going to help anyone. Um, because they don't want to help you. They don't want the truth. They just want to put people in jail. Exactly. So they can get promotions or they yeah. can, you know, whatever it is. So, and then when my son, my two oldest two sons were born there, and then eventually the third was born there as well. But then we were doing experimental medicine in the United States and decided we had to stay in Italy so that my son could do the experimental medicine. Mm. And so then there we were. And then the second FBI investigation happened in around 98, I think it was called, uh, Operation Ghost Payroll or something, if I'm not mistaken, or Grey Lord, whatever it was. But um, I uh, had a, 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 an Italian-American who I helped fund to become a, a senator, state senator and committeeman in the southwest side of Chicago. And um, he eventually got investigated. Um, and I was the money behind him, supposedly. Um, it was a great story, by the way. It was an all-Polish ward. Um, he was Italian, you know, like I, I'll never forget. I went to uh, the committeeman at the time who was Polish, of course, but living full time in Florida and uh, telling him, yeah, we want to get Bobby. Bobby is going to become, you know, the committeeman. And he was like 83, so he didn't care. And, you know, we said, we'll have a party for you. You'll make at least 100,000 at your politically po political party. We'll hire your daughter. And he still thought it was a joke that we'd never get an Italian elected in an all, all Polish ward. Um, and then on the deadline of the election, uh, the genius behind it all named Greg, uh, got seven people. So the guy we went against, I can't remember his name. I'm going to say it was Kowalczak. So the day that, that you had to have your name in the election, we had seven other people join and their name was Kowalski, Kowalska, Kowski. So it ended up being one Italian name against seven Polish names. The seven Polish got less than, you know, 10 or 12% each, and the Italian got elected. Well, for some other reasons, uh, there ended up being a big investigation into corruption at City Hall in Chicago. Surprise, surprise. And uh, I decided to uh, leave again. What was the reason for the investigation? Uh, they claimed that people weren't working 
They, they, they Who were, claimed? The, the government claimed that people were uh, being paid but not working. So I'm pretty sure it was called uh, Ghost Payroll, uh, Project or uh, Ghost Payroll. Um, and actually, uh, one of my close friends went away for about five and a half years because a Polish woman said that he sold her a liquor license, actually. So was that like was part laundering? of the investigation. Could have been. You know, when the FBI gets involved, they, they throw everything out there. It's anything they can throw at you, they do. Um, but that was the second time that uh, I was involved. And so you I, evaded I them successfully. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I wasn't, uh, I, I, I wasn't the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, um, the target. Uh, they were targeting mostly politicians, and uh, I went to Italy. But the, the crazy thing was that when my friend Greg... Um, I was in Alta, I was in Alta Muro, my town. He was going to court. The Polish woman shows up that he supposedly sold the liquor license to. They ask her to get up and put her hand on his shoulder. She puts her hand on his attorney's shoulder, and we're figuring we're all done. Uh, but instead, unfortunately, one of the Chicago politicians, Alderman, um, who had a heart condition, ended up collaborating with the FBA, FBI and signed a lot of documents saying that Greg did this, Greg did this, Greg did this, Greg did this. Greg gets convicted anyway, um, and then he needed to straighten things out with his family. He had his three children living with him. They were 14 years old, four, 10 to 14 years old. I send a check for $25,000 um, to make sure that he can um, stay outside what, between the time he was convicted and the time that they give him the sentencing. Mm you know, where he's going to go and uh, how much time. And uh, the FBI stands up in court and says, I'm a mobster hiding in Italy. Uh, Greg is going to fly to Italy. I mean, he, he, Greg was Polish. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he doesn't speak Italian. I, I have no idea what he's going to do in Italy. But mm -hmm. the FBI objected to me putting up the money for him to have that time to get his family in order, you know. So it, it's kind of How would they say you're a mobster? Stuff. Did you ever have any kind of connections to the mob? You know what? I grew up in Bridgeport. It was, if you watched the, the, the film Casino, you got the two guys that got killed at the end, the Spalatro brothers. I think uh, they called them Santoro brothers. Uh, you know, my ex-wife went to school with their daughter, one of their daughters. And the neighborhood was all those guys that, uh, you know, supposedly ran, the, you know, uh, um, Las Vegas back at the time, which they did, by the way. And, mm -hmm. you know, then the government decided to give it to the corrupt orations, so they knocked them out of there. But, yeah, I mean, you know, people could say anything. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a, I was in the military. I tried to be a good guy. All of my money was made legally. I have my, you know, I file my taxes every year, but people could say anything. So you never actually got popped or did any time for anything at all? No. I've been arrested for a bunch of stuff, but mostly kids' stuff. What, uh... What gave you the confidence that you could come back to the U.S. and not have any heat on you? Uh, I waited the time, you know, so I would wait a couple of years and then come back. Uh, one time it was hilarious. Um, Joe Farrell, my attorney, I was every time I would come back after I bailed uh, Greg out, uh, the judge eventually, by the way, said that the FBI, OK, you know, I have to listen to the FBI. So, Mr. Geronda, you have to get to me you know, five letters of recommendation and your last three years of your tax returns, I need to know where that money c is coming from that you're going to bail Mr. Swan out with. And um, I eventually wrote a letter to the judge myself, and I said, Dear Your Honor, you know, I'm an American citizen, proud to be an American citizen. I served in the military. And when I was growing up, we were taught that you don't, don't turn your back on your friends. And Mr. Swan needs to put... I'm sorry, I said his name. Uh, Greg needs to put his house in order. And uh, I was told that if I put the money up, I would have trouble with the IRS and possibly the FBI. But I'm a true American, and I'm not turning my back on my friend. And I kind of think that that was the letter you that sold the it? judge said. Yeah, that <laughs> sold it and got it home. And in fact, I was audited seven out of the nine in the next years. Every time I came to the United wow, States, really? they stopped me at the border and they made me miss my flights. And it was one of the times I was in one of these little glass rooms and on the thing it says, if you feel that your rights are being abused, call 1-800-whatever. And I copied the number down. I called one of my attorneys, Joey Farrell. He said, Joe, do me a favor. Call these morons. I mean, what are they doing? I was on my way to Miami. They made me miss my flight again. You know, every time they're, they're, they're messing with me, you know. 
So about a week later, Joe calls me. He says, uh, Pat, I, uh, I talked to the FBI. I said, okay. Are you going to stop messing with me? He said, well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Well, what do they say? Well, they said that they know what they're doing and that if I'm representing a piece of shit like you, that I must be a piece of shit as well and that I have two kids and a law practice and basically told me that if I didn't stop representing you, that I would also have trouble. And I said, Joey, I love you. You're a great guy. Forget about it. And that's it. I forgot about it. Didn't call him anymore. Um, but that's exactly what happened. And in 2001, one of my best friends committed suicide. He worked for me. Terry, great guy, grew up together. Um, he committed suicide. And uh, at the time, his mother had just passed away. He wasn't married. Um, and we were going through a, getting a banking license in uh, Switzerland. He was under a lot of pressure. And he did what he did. And uh, in 2003, that was when Joey Farrell, two years after Terry was dead, by the way, that was when Joey Farrell went to the FDI, FBI and, or the FBI, the government, and said, look, you know, I got to fill out this form because you're messing with my client. Well, when they do that, the FBI has 10 years to come back and let you know what happened in the investigation. So I was in, uh, on vacation in Florida, 2013. My brother Georgie had just passed away. I was a little bit down. And I got a call from a friend of mine. He goes, you know, I got a book at, at my house that came in your name. And I said, oh, yeah, ship it to me. I'm in Miami. I get it. I open it up. It's not a book. It's a pamphlet. It's an FBI pamphlet. So it was 2013. They had to, by law, 10 years later, let, them, let me know that I was the subject of an investigation. When my close friend, Terry, committed suicide, I was in Italy. The FBI <clears throat> investigated me for murder. They followed me around 2002 and 2001 and 2003. They had almost every single thing was blacked out. But you could get little glimpses of here and there, and they had to send it to me. Who knows how much money they spent on doing something so stupid. What did you have to do to get this? What was it, like an FBI report or something? Right, so when Joe filed and said, I think that my mm. client's uh, rights are being infringed upon, right, of being abused, right. he filled out the paperwork. Gone. Before he started dancing with them. And so they have 10 years and they must let you know the results within 10 years. And so they send it on the 10th year all the time. Right. And so I got it in 2013. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, it brought tears to me. I mean, and I they redacted parts oh, of it. Oh, the whole thing is redacted. I mean, I never even read the whole thing. I got it sitting in my home in Italy, actually. I mm. never sat down and said, I'm going to concentrate on this. It was just so absurd. I mean, yeah. forget about the waste of taxpayers' money. Oh, my God. But, you know, this is coming because in 89, Maybe they wanted me, and I went to Italy. And they called me, and I said, I'll be there next week. I'll be there next week. I'll be there next week. And maybe they thought I was, you know, pulling their leg. Then in 97, 98, whenever it was, they wanted me again. And I said, oh, I'll be there next week. I'll be there next month. I'll be whatever. Yeah. So then, okay, this happens. Well, oh, yeah, but didn't that guy work for Gerondi? Well, okay, you know, you know who Gerondi is. One thing leads to another. And the morons are investigating for murder like one of my best friends. I they mean, were, it's they just, were trying to pin it on you. Right, exactly. I mean, it, it, it's just absurd. Um, and don't get me wrong. I know a couple FBI agents that are great guys, by the way. Phil is a, is a close friend of mine. I love him, you know, and he's a retired FBI guy. And there's a, a lot of great guys. And there's a lot of great congressmen and a lot of great congresswomen and a lot of great politicians, etc. It's just unfortunate that greed <laughs> ends up being one of the strongest characteristics in humans. Mm. And so what happens? Who goes to the top? The greediest politicians. Yeah. Who goes to the top? The greediest FBI guys. Yeah. Who goes to the top? The greediest executives. And the result is, you know, I always say that the, the modern father 
of the United States of America is Benito Mussolini. Why? Well, because he invented fascism. Because Benito thought he was a country guy. He wasn't, you know, a greedy guy. But he thought if I get industry together with the politicians, it'll be the best country in the world. We'll be efficient. And we'll protect the, ind- we'll protect the workers, right, from industry with politicians. So the politicians will make sure that industry won't take over and abuse the workers. Mm-hmm. And that's fascism. And in the United States, that's what we have. The industry owns the politicians today, but the politicians don't protect the people because right. they sell them out to the industry. So in the end, Benito Mussolini is uh, you know, the father of modern-day America. That kind of permeates through every big industry. They just are constantly trying to create products to make more money, and it kind of is the same thing with big pharma, where they're not necessarily trying to innovate or make things better for people or better humanity. They're just trying to make more money and make more profit. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, that's the exact truth. I mean, I drive, when I'm in Florida, I bought a 2009 Sebring convertible. I paid $6,500. In Italy, I drive a 1996 Fiat. Now, don't get me wrong. I got a nice house in Italy, etc. But, you know, I'm Catholic. And, uh, I was taught that we're all brothers and sisters, and a lot of our patients are Muslim, a lot of our patients are Hindus, a lot of our patients are <clears throat> Africans, etc. And, you know, for me, being Catholic is the easiest thing in the world because, you know, I was taught from the time I was a little kid that, you know, we're all brothers and sisters, man, and you have to take care of your brother and your sister. Um, so... But you just don't have a lot of that going on. Instead, what you have is, unfortunately, Amazon, who's paying their drivers $20 an hour, you know. And, I mean, I'd like to see Bezos come and try to load one of those trucks. I mean, you know, what kind of crazy world did we ever get into where we've got people that have, you know, billions of dollars, and then we have people that can't afford health care in the same country? I mean, that's like wacko. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least in Europe. Italy in particular, you know, we have social medicine. Thank God. You break your leg. They don't care what your name is. You go in and you get it fixed. I mean, how can we be one of the greatest countries in the world? We don't have social medicine. And what is all this craziness about, you know, people taking out loans to go to school? I mean, what what, what is that? And then you're making them pay 8% juice on going to school? I mean, you know, my kid Chicho, he's an architect today. Um, You know, he's in, in Italy, born and raised in Italy. Well, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. You know, first he wanted to be an economist, and then he decided not to be an economist after two years. Then he decided to be an architect. It's free. <laughs> he went seven years. One year he went to Portugal. One year he went to Germany. They paid him to go to school in Portugal and Germany. Didn't cost me a nickel. Wow. And at the same time, I mean, here we are in the United States of America. These poor people, I've got one of my nieces, they're nurses. They're still paying back student loans. And we say, we're the most powerful, strong, best nation in the world. Well, we, we may not have good college or free college. It may cost a, a fortune to go to college. It may cost a fortune to get decent medical care, but at least we have the strongest military in the world, the most nukes. Yes. Right? Isn't that crazy? I I mean, there's actually, a silver lining to all of I, this, Patrick. You know what? I, I, had, I had that argument with a woman at one time. I was in a... At least we could kill everybody if we needed right. to. She told me we could kill everybody 30 times. And she was very <laughs> proud of that, by the way. I just wanted to let you know that. And don't get me wrong. There's no perfect place. You know, not China, not Japan, not Italy, not... No, no place. Everybody has their whole problems. And that's because, guess what? We're all human. And even though we'd like to put, I was reading a, an article about this 30-year-old teacher, a woman, who got caught making out with a 17-year-old student, and instead of giving her an award, you know, they talk about teaching sex education at school. I mean, maybe she taught him how to kiss better. She's going to jail. I mean, out of your out of your, are you out of your freaking mind? I mean, <laughs> I don't, I get it. You don't, you want to fire her because maybe teachers shouldn't be doing that, but what good do you get out of throwing her in jail for something so crazy isn't italy doing some wacky shit with with uh covid yes and my good friend is the head 
of the health department in Italy named Franco Locatelli, and I love him. He's the head of the health department? Yes, he is the highest ranking doctor in the health department. Really? And he's uh, from Bergamasco, from Bergamo. And he talks like this even when he speaks in English or Italian and everyone makes fun of him. But he's a great guy. I love him. And he's just really well-intentioned and believed that, you know, he hook, line, and sinker, that you've got to wear masks, you've got to do a, a, a vaccine. And, you know, one of the worst problems I had in Italy in the beginning, I don't know if you, you know this. So we were one of the first countries to get back, and we were putting people on ventilators. Well, guess what? When you put an 85-year-old man or woman on a ventilator, right. they're not coming off. Right. Now we don't use ventilators anymore, by the way. But in the beginning, we had the most deaths out of anyone. But in the end, was it really COVID? Yeah, it was COVID, I guess. But it kind of was because we were putting all these people on ventilators. So almost the healthcare system was too good mm. because we were able to treat all these people on ventilators where a lot of places, they don't have that many ventilators. But so Italy did some wacky stuff, in my opinion. And I could be wrong, by the way. And I love Franco. Forgive me, Franco, if, you know, because I know that you've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that listen to your podcast. Oh, he's got a podcast. <laughs> no, your podcast. Oh, my podcast. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I thought I you said know. Franco had Yeah, him. and I don't know if Franco will do it, but, uh, um, you know, a lot of good intention people. And I've got a guy, Johnny Tisdale, love him with all my heart, works at the NIH. He worked for years with Fauci or worked, has experience with him, et cetera. And Johnny almost screamed and yelled at me when I tried to said, well, Johnny, I'm not sure that the vaccine helped. What do you mean they don't help? They do help. And everybody should wear a mask. And, and you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the people that think the masks don't work are wrong. And maybe the people that think the masks work are right. And maybe the people that think you should get vaccinated are right. I don't know. But I just think we should all make the best decisions we can and leave the dollar bills out of it. Mm. Best decisions for ourselves, not for other people necessarily. Yeah, I mean, oh, God. Is that's that, a, that's a hard one, too. Oh, my God. What, a hard one. What is the rules? Is there a rule? Is there, you have to be vaccinated to go to Italy? Yes. You do. I, I, I think they just the other day cut it out, but up until the other day, and it might still be going on. You Can you find out, Austin? Uh, this kid travels to more countries than anybody ever fucking known. This kid, he's never available to, to run the podcast because he's always in some fucking European country or some African island or something. Nice, Austin. So, Austin, you should know this. Weren't you just in Italy? No, Spain. Oh, Spain. Did okay, you, but I think they... Are you vaccinated? Yeah. Oh, you gotta be. Okay. No, <laughs> without a doubt. You have to be vaccinated. I had a European uh, vaccine card in France. You even got your own European vaccine card? Do you have one of these? Yes, of course. I get one of these. Yes, they I have one as well. In yeah. Pretty much so you need that to basically get around Europe. In Chicago, or in, Chicago, in Italy. Yeah. So I had a friend coming from Croatia. And a kid I grew up with, by the way, that moved from Chicago to Croatia. Anyway, and by the way, you want to hear that story. He got diagnosed with prostate cancer. Three medical centers in Chicago, Northwestern, University of Chicago, and Loyola. And he came to me, he says, Pat, I got problems. I go, what's the problem? This is six years ago. I got prostate cancer. Well, how did you know that? Why did you go get tested? Well, because they say you should get tested every year. I'm 53 or 54, so I got tested. So wait a minute, stop. You out of the blue went and got tested for prostate cancer. Well, that's what you do in America, Pat. Okay, got it, I got it, okay. And they told you you have it. Yeah, three centers told me. What are your systems, Carl? What are your symptoms? I don't have any. Carl... I think you should go to Europe and get the test there. So guess what? That's what he did. He went to Croatia, and they said, you don't have cancer. Really? You have an enlarged po- prostate. In the United States, that's what they're doing. They're treating all, of, and they've treated tens of thousands of men over the last 20 years for prostate cancer. They made it a part of the protocol because you make a lot of money. Was this during a routine people. checkup they told him this? <clears throat> no, he went to get it checked. Okay. Prostate, and they, but that's a routine the, thing. The PSA though, right? number, okay. which, by the way, if you talk to the guy that invented the PSA number, which Carl did, he said, "I never invented it to have anything to do with prostate cancer, but because of the corruption in the medical industry, we've treated tens of thousands. I mean, ten years ago, they'd say, if you live long enough, you're going to die from prostate cancer. Every man gets it. I mean, it was all bullshit, just like they did with the cesareans, you know, in the '90s. You know, one out of four uh, births in the United States." We're pop cesareans. So if, if you get diagnosed with prostate cancer, what is 
the go-to treatment for that and who profits off that the most? This might be a re- dumb question, but uh, I don't know. I mean, prostate cancer, you know. Is there with, is there like a certain medication that, well, co- I mean, it's just chemotherapy, well, chemotherapy and, and radiation. Radiation and then years of who knows what. I mean, you'll be incontinent a lot of the times. I mean, it just, you turn into this cash register basically for so many f- parts of the, you know, American uh, medical society. I mean, mm. I'm not kidding you. I mean, I would almost tell anyone who ends up being diagnosed with prostate cancer to take a trip somewhere else and, you know, get it checked as well. Maybe Canada, maybe Mexico or whatever. Again, you might have prostate cancer and I don't want to, you know, pe- you know, uh, sugar coat it. A right. lot of people die from real prostate cancer, mm. but a lot of people are being diagnosed with prostate cancer when they have a uh, enlarged prostate and not prostate cancer, but because the protocol says that the doctor will be sued if he doesn't basically tell the patient, look, you should get, you know, chemo, we should do this, let's be safe, all that kind of stuff, you know, he can get sued and uh, lose his license, et cetera, for not following protocol. And since the pharma companies now are basically writing the protocols, you're getting treated for prostate cancer, whether you have a large prostate or your prostate cancer. Yeah, there's a weird thing about being diagnosed with things too, especially like cancer. When you're told that you have something, it's kind of like there's a thing that happens, like a self-fulfilling prophecy where if you believe that you have a disease, even if you don't have it, you can end up suffering from that very disease. Like, right, like, you have it. Yeah. If, what do you if, believe you have? If you believe you have it, there's guess so what? Many you do things. have it. Right, if you believe you have it, you you do have it. The mind is such a powerful fucking thing that... You know, if you get it, it, there's so many different variables from like depression that sets in that just it speeds up the not only sure, if, even if you, you sick, if you, you don't already have it, sick. right, it's going to speed up the process of death and you believe you're going to die. Like if somebody tells you you have six months to live, a lot of times that will happen. Sure, sure. And I mean, look at the numbers. <laughs> you know, we spend 20% of the American budget, right, is for health care. But wait a minute. The government's spending 20%, and yet we have all these people spending. I mean, I know I have friends spending 3000 a month on their insurance. So not only are you paying out of your pocket for your health insurance, the government's spending 20%. Italy spends 9.7%, and we all have health care. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not perfect. There's some bad doctors. There's some bad hospitals, etc. But the average Italians live in 82.7. The average American 78, 78.9. What are you talking about, 82.7? Death of, you know, mortality. So the average Italian lives almost four years longer than the average American, yet the Italians are spending 9.7% of their budget on health care. The Americans are spending 20%, and then who knows how many more trillions of dollars that the private person is spending on it. Right. And we're living almost four years less. This was up until the COVID. The COVID probably knocked things out of whack. But up until COVID... So 2019, the average Italian was 82.7, the average American 78.9. So almost Mm. four years longer, 5% of your life, if you lived in Italy, you live longer. And yet we're spending probably five, six, seven times more on healthcare in the United States than we are in Italy. What the fuck? Was that Austin? The thing happened. (laughs) It happened again. It's still still happening. What'd you do? Just change the audio on the on the uh, the audio output. I hope we're not like you know getting somebody pissed off. That's kind of like you know in a couple minutes it'll get louder and then maybe the whole place will explode or no no no. Maybe it's the FBI listening in. Yeah, whatever. And by the way, you know, I mean, I don't don't get me wrong. I'm not one of these conspiracy guys. All that shit, I, I don't. But you know what? Unfortunately. Um, Each of us, if we have a sick child, sick father, whatever it is, you know, you got to think about the words that I'm saying, and you can never be too careful. And, uh, you know, when I have a problem in Italy, I go to my coffee shop, right? And, uh, hey, Miguel, portami un caffè. And then I watch for my doctor whose office is right in front of my coffee shop, and I go, Hey, Rafael, vieni do, vien, vien. And I say, Rafael, what the fuck is going on right up here? Look at above my belly button fuck is that oh patrizio sembra che hai un hernia you have a hernia what the fuck what was it gonna hurt me i mean what do you eh patrizio you know you should probably get it taken out i mean let me let me push you know push you want hop, hop in my van yeah you know <laughs> he says uh, you, you want a cafe Raffaele? yeah Miguel, 
Get a cafe, Pedro Doctor, eh? Okay, no. Does it hurt like this? No. Hurt like this? No. Like this? Yes, that hurts. Okay, listen, Patrizio, you know it's July. You don't want to get an operation in July, August, right? You know, come on. He says, are you going to America anytime soon? Yeah, I'm going to leave. When are you leaving? September. When are you coming back? Uh, November. Call me when you come back. Okay, and I go on and I get paid. Now, Rafael probably makes fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. As a doctor or a surgeon? As a doctor. Okay. As surgeons, doctors, they make mostly the same thing, you know. But their kids get free health care. Their kids get free universities. Mm. So, I mean, you know, I don't know. What are they really making if you compare it to an American person? They don't pay any real estate tax on their house, by the way. Really? Yes. But that's all Italian citizens. You don't pay no real estate tax on your first residence. Your second one, they stick it in your ass. But your first one, you pay no. <laughs> you know, but my point is. What is the is tax on the second one? Whatever. You know, we have kind of luxury taxes. Okay. It's kind of with cars. If you can afford to buy a $10,000 car, you pay 10000 If you can afford to buy a 50000 car, you pay seventy. If you can afford to buy a Lamborghini, you're paying a million, even though it costs 500000 hmm. You know, we call it luxury tax. <clears throat> but in the United States, we had a reasonable system up until Ronald Reagan. You know, people loved Reagan. Oh, he's the greatest, and he's handsome. But And I don't want to hurt break any of you guys' hearts. And I actually was a delegate to the 1982 convention or 80 convention. I was a Democratic delegate, you know, and I wore a button, Democrats for Reagan, you know, because I thought he was going to be great as well. But I look back at the history of the United States, and I think that Ronald Reagan did two of the worst things that any president ever did. And that was he lowered the taxes from 70%. So he basically took the money that the rich people were paying, and he put it on the middle class. And then the other nasty thing he did was he went after the Air Traffic Control Union, which was open game on the unions. Today, the unions are, you know, we went from a country in 1980 that we had 34% of all of our employees were covered by unions. And the other 66% were treated very fairly by their bosses. Mm -hmm. Guess why? They didn't want unions. Exactly, the threat of it. To today, less than 9% have unions, and they're all impotent. So when I look at the downfall of the middle class in the United States of America, and by the way, it is really shot. Yeah. It's Ronald Reagan lowering the taxes to 70%, and I know I'm going to get a lot of even my buddies, you know, because my buddies are, hey, man, you know, that was the greatest time in the 90s. I made so much money, man, and you're out of your mind, and you're a liberal, and, you know, what are you talking about, Ronald Reagan and John Wayne? And, you know, I'm like, well, okay, you know, don't get me wrong. I got nothing against either of them, but it was a real bad thing if we look at our country, you know, when we took the burden of the taxes off of the wealthy, you know, and gave it to the poor. And they say, well, what are you, one of those socialists, communists? And I'm like, yeah, like Christ. He was a socialist and a communist, by the way. But let's think about it this. Really? Because, yes, he was. Of course he was. He was he, a communist? Of course he was. He lived in a commune, man. He lived with 12 unemployed oh. guys and an ex-hooker. And they went from town to town. They lived a communal life and they begged for food. And they say, hey, you know, yes, he I was. Need to, I need to read the Bible so I don't sound like such an idiot on this podcast. No, but I mean, yes. I mean, of course he was, you know. And he said, if you got two shirts, give one away, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, um, I talked to all my friends about I always thought he was a capitalist. Maybe we, maybe we. Well, uh, but you know what? In the end, I always say that capitalism is great. Fantastic. I'm a capitalist, but it's got to have a socialist heart. You know, mm. you know, you got guys like Warren Buffett and who knows, good, bad. I'm not saying he's good or bad. He's saying, yeah, I pay more taxes than my, than my, uh, than my uh, what do you call it? My uh, waitress or what do you call on the people in the house? My servants, my maids. Maids. I mean, they, yeah, they give them good names, but they're basically servants or whatever, housekeeper. You know, I pay more taxes than her. And I'm telling you, we've got to go back to the old system. And all you guys who want to debate me, Okay, I say, yes, we should all pay the same amount of taxes. Mm -hmm. All right? So up until 50000 nobody pays any taxes. Nobody! Between fifty and 150000 we all pay 15%. Between 150 and 400, we pay 25. Between 500000 or 400000 to 7, we pay. 50%. And between 10 million and up, you pay 
Hmm. And they say, well, that's socialism. No, 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 no. I'm saying we all pay the same amount of taxes. We just don't all make $10 million a year. Right. But if a guy paid 90% and made $10 million, he'd make a million dollars cash a year. So what? What's so bad about that? Yeah. What's so hard about that? Yeah. Well, there's so many creative loopholes. Unless too. there is. But that's why I'm saying make it that way. And then guess what? When every American citizen has health care, when every American citizen has the universities and all that, you know what? We can think about changing our tax system. Yeah. But until then, we should be very embarrassed that the greatest nation, and in a lot of ways we are the greatest nation, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you got the Statue of Liberty, man. Bring me your uh, trudged and bring me your criminals and bring me your downtrodden and whatever it says on that, you know. And we got more people locked up, I think, than any country, right? Yeah, we got 3% of the population basically either locked up or on parole. Yeah. That's crazy, man. That's something to be proud of. But come on, Danny. There, are, Okay, I agree, and it's crazy, and it's even crazy because a lot of these jails are now for profit. That's right. how you had back in Philadelphia about right. 15 years ago, two judges who were getting $10,000 for every kid they thought they threw into, you know, whatever. And it, But it is a great country, Danny. It is a wonderful country filled with like 90% no, of the people are like bread and butter, like salt to the earth, great people. It's just that you got these right now, by the way, you've got, you know, Me Too, LGBTQ, XYZ, you know, uh, and BLM. And they're like, you know, running the country and they got the corporate corrupt orations, which are giving them tens of millions of dollars and twenties of millions of dollars. And they're, they're ripping the whole nation apart, by the way. And it's not a free place. But the <clears throat> problem is that the average guy and woman who are working very hard to put their kids through school, they don't have time to like get out on the streets and protest and they don't, you know, they just want to raise their kids. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And the politicians have sold out to the special interest groups and those special interest groups are terrorist organizations, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's all the, the left, the left wing party uses those sort of like cultural, you know, LGBTQ BLM, those sort of like social justice causes, to they kind of weaponize those causes for themselves to fight the right you know because the right is sort of like they're ingrained in in you know business and finance and sort of like the big money stuff it's about money and and the left really had nothing i mean that that sort of like happened when did that that happened in the 60s right when the left sort of took art and culture and sort of that's what um uh, that's what uh malcolm x's famous speech was about how the he talks about the lib, uh, white liberal versus the white conservative. How the difference between the white liberal and the white conservative, the only difference between them is that the white liberal is more deceitful because they weaponize art and they weaponize culture and music and they sexuality, sexuality, all that stuff to try to, you know, fight the, the conservatives yeah and they and use it, that it, it's just all a political game and they use the he said they use the the black man as a pawn in their game to to fight the other party oh yeah and <clears throat> you know i've got you know i mean i'll tell you a little story when i was 15 i worked in a hospital kitchen it was northwestern university hospital in chicago and um i you know went into the hospital kitchen i was the only light-skinned guy that worked in the hospital everybody else was dark-skinned and i had this guy kevin and i definitely won't say his last name <laughs> um, I, I said, I had Kevin, he was like three years older than me, tall, lanky guy, hated my guts and, um, tried to beat me up. And I had this, uh, big dark skinned woman on the, the bread line, bread line or the food line, you know, they put on jello and they put on fish and they put on corn and they put on green beans and all of that. And they all wore these smocks, you know, you could hardly see their faces and all of these big white dresses and all of that. And she protected me from this guy and she was just incredible. And, um, I was at the hospital. I worked there for about a year, year and a half. And luckily for this woman, you know, she saved me and I was less terrorized. And um, uh, years later, uh, there's this, uh, I had a priest named uh, Father Frawley. He told me about this black kid, wanted to become a priest. I helped the black kid. I paid for four years of his uh, high school education. He lives in Tampa now. He's my one of my closest friends. His name is Derek. And uh, just a great guy. And uh, Derek called me in maybe 2013 or 14. He says, where are you at? And I says, uh... Hey, little brother, I'm in Chicago by, you know, he says, oh, good. You got to come to my, uh, 
my my mother's funeral. She died. And I said, oh, geez. And I had met his mother a couple of times. And I said, Derek, geez, you know, I'm really sorry. Where's it at? 50th and State. I'll come to 50th and State at the church. So I go to the church, and I see my old boss from the hospital kitchen. Uh, Ross, his name was. And I said, Ross, what's going on, you know? What's, you know, uh, Pat, we were so proud of you. We saw you on Oprah Winfrey show and, you know, and I said, yeah, I'm really sorry. I never came back to say hi to you, but you know, a lot of years had passed and all that. And I said, but you know what, this is finally time for me to make amends to big mama, because that's what everybody called her. The woman who saved my ass from Kevin so many times. I said, do you think she'll show up at the funeral today? Or can you give me your address? And he looked at me funny. He said, Pat, this is big mama's funeral. I never knew that the kid I paid for his high school education, I helped him through college. Hmm. I never knew that when I was 15, it was his mother who saved my ass. Really? And all of this craziness about, you know, outside of Chicago, they got a couple of suburbs I read today that are going to start getting, based on your skin color, they're going to give you a different grading system. Because they're going to try to make up from whatever happened. You, you know, and it's insanity. You're ruining these children. You are using these children. You are abusing these children. Where did you hear this? Uh, it's two suburbs in Chicago. I think one is River Forest and the other one is Oak Park. But they're doing it in different states where they're going to start using the grading system, d- using different grading system based mm. on the color of your skin. Wow. Kind of like affirmative action. <laughs> Have you? Do you hear about the uh, the school in Cal or Colorado that had uh, designated playtime for children of color? <laughs> it's it's uh, there's a, a podcast called "I'm Doing Great" podcast that the girl who's the host of it she was talking about this thing called horseshoe theory. She says uh, uh, horseshoe theory. The concept of it is um, what are the KKK and um, or, I'm sorry, what do the, uh, the Baptist and the bootlegger have in common? They both want alcohol to be illegal. The bootlegger wants it to be illegal because he makes more money. The Baptist wants it to be illegal because ah, okay, it's okay, out of okay, morals. Got it, got it, got it. Right? So the complete opposite ends of the spectrum as far as ideology, and they want the same result. The KKK and woke leftists, they both want segregation. Uh, they're getting it, by the way. I mean, I've never seen the country more, more, more divided. And I have so many friends, whatever they could be. They could I thought be. that was hilarious. Oh yeah, it is. It, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's like they got my my favorite, my new favorite comedian, who is a David Chappelle, by the way. I think his name is it. Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Oh yeah, my new guy. I don't care what anybody. He is my guy. Um, uh, but you know, it's just incredible what they're doing. And I have so many friends, and they could be light brown, dark brown. I'm tan. They could be you know, light black, I call them chocolate, whatever. They could have this different color of skin, but they're 100% against affirmative action. They say, Pat, I got to be honest with you. I've always been against it because I've had different clients who have questioned my integrity or my quality as an attorney because they're thinking that maybe I got to where I am because of affirmative action. Mm. I mean, it's asinine. You have to stop it. It's just crazy. Mm. And you know what? I mean, you know, it's like, uh, they, they always said, no, you know, no, uh, all, we're all created equal. No, we're not. No two men are created equal. Everyone's different. That's the most asinine thing I've ever had, heard. <laughs> we're, you know, we're all created equal. Bullshit. It's not true. I'm a dumb guy. Don't get me wrong. 99% of the people on the planet are smarter than me. I am not created equal. But at the end of the day, we have, we are dealt cards. That's our hand. And guess what? That's what we got to play with. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do. So how did this lawsuit come about? Okay, so that's a great question. So in 2010, Pacharandi and San Roco Therapeutics delivered to the world the first commercial batch. That's your company? Yes. Okay. San Roco Therapeutics, therapeutics de- de- delivered the world's first batch of gene therapy for sickle cell disease and thalassemia known to man. Because up until then, it took a million dollars per patient to make and you could only make it one batch at a time for 1.3 million dollars it took a million dollars per patient to make what the vector the vector remember we were talking about the the h yes gene therapy vector so we were able for 1.3 million dollars to make enough for 10 people so we brought it down from a million to one you know to 130,000 a person which was incredible okay 
And then a company called Bluebird Bio wanted to buy us. And uh, they were basically owned by Third Rock Ventures, which, you know, is one of these funds that had billions and billions of dollars. And so, sorry to, to interrupt your story, but I'm, I'm curious, how did you do that? How did you go about finding a way to make it so much more economical to do that? Okay, so the real hero in all of this, this is a French researcher named Michel Settelin and his wife, wife Isabelle Riviere. They basically, between the two of them, invented the beta globin gene and then were able to package it to be able to get it into a human cell. They started with mice. Those are the heroes. How did you find them? Uh, I read about it in 2000 in Nature Magazine. Wow. So I met them in 2000. Met their kids <clears throat> in time. They know my kids, all of that. And I began funding them. And then in 2005, I bought their product. I licensed it to go forward to commercialize it. Nobody cared about it. I tried to get other drug companies to do it, but nobody wanted it. Did you try it, test it on your son? No, 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 no. no. Um, we, up until now, we've only done it on three people. Bluebird oh, really? has done it on up to 46 people or 50 people even. So in 2010, I'm with my president, Sam Salmon. We drive to go see Bluebird Bio's new CEO, Nick Leshley. And we go see Neil Lexter, and we go see these, you know, multi-gazillionaires that own Third Rock Ventures. And they want to do a deal with us. So in 2005, nobody believed in gene therapy. I tried to talk to Shire. I talked to Elon. I talked to Merck. I talked Elon? E-L-A-N. It's an oh, Irish company. I thought you said Elon. Yeah, no, Elon. So I talked to all these companies about doing gene therapy, and they thought I was nuts, you know. Gene therapy is never going to work, you know. And so in 2010, all of a sudden, Third Rock Ventures buys Bluebird Bayou, which was a French company, by the way. And the difference between my French researcher and theirs was that my French researcher was first. So we have the wild-type beta globin gene in our product. And instead, they have a mutant gene in their product, okay? Well, they paid $35 million for the bum dope for the shit product. What do you mean mutant gene? So you change the gene. So I have the beta globin gene that you have in your body is what we put into our patient's body. Okay. But to get around the patent, basically, the other researcher had to change it. And you could change it just, right. you know, small, making the plasmid a little smaller, introducing another plasmid, changing the uh, chronological order or whatever. Okay. So it's still the beta globin gene, but it's a mutant gene. Just modified a little bit. Modified. Perfect. So they had bought this modified gene, and I'm mm -hmm. like, what the fuck's wrong with these guys? They paid $35 million for this fucking, this, this modified gene. I mean, like, are they nuts, you know? But they're all Harvard, Yale, all this bullshit, you know, banksters. So I go there, and, you know, I get there, and they blow smoke up my ass, you know. How do you always do? Oh, Pat, you're the best father in the world, and all well, you did for your kid, and all of this, you know. But by the way, we are banksters, and we got more money than God, and so you should do a deal with us. And I said, okay, I'll do a de deal with you, you know, uh, Fester. Uh, but you bought bum dope, you bought shit. So what you got to do with Patrandi because. I don't give a shit about the money necessarily, but I do have shareholders who have invested money, so we got to take care of them. But the most important thing you got to do is promise that you use my medicine because I'm using the real beta globin gene, not a mutant gene. So they listen to me and they say, okay. And then I said, and by the way, you've spent $35 million for that shit. Mine's got to be worth three fifty, And... I'm not telling you I want 350. But, you know, we got the real thing. I got shareholders. We got to take care of them, you know, because it's the right thing to do. I'm an American. I'm a capitalist. I got the right thing. You didn't. We got to do things the right way. We got to be honorable men and women. They went behind my back, and they sabotaged the product. We've got all the emails. They were saying crazy sh shit at board members. They were at board meetings. Danny. They were saying, we got to shoot Gerondi down. What do you mean they sabotaged your product? Right. So first they admit that my product is three to time, five times better than theirs. Okay. We've got, we've got it. Read it in the book. Okay. Don't listen to me. <clears throat> Read it in the book. It all came out in discovery. 
Girondi's product is three to five times better than ours. It'll add two hundred million dollars to our company if we can sabotage it and shelve it and get it. They go behind my back. They go to the people where I license the product from. And I have a non-disparagement, so I have to be careful careful about this. Not against Bluebird, who, by the way, it cost a million dollars when I wouldn't sign the, the non-disparagement of Blue, against Bluebird. <laughs> anyway, so they go behind my back. You mean you, you could... They tried to pay you a million dollars to sign a non-disparagement, and you didn't take it. Yeah, the other side. So there was two people that had to settle up with me at the end. And when I said, I won't talk bad about this not-for-profit any longer because they're a great institution. Yeah. And I don't like the executives, and maybe they did a lot of bad things that they should, have had, should not have, but I'm not going to talk about it because they are a good institution. But Bluebird Bio, as soon as I walk out of the room, I'm going to tell the world what they did. Right. Well, that great institution basically had to give a million dollars to Blue or Bio because I wouldn't sign the non-disparagement. Oh, wow. True story. Wow. So basically, they go behind my shoulder. Okay, and they went right to the company you were licensing it from. Right, and they basically say, you know, Durandi's nuts. You know, he makes videos. He's a rock star in Italy. I mean, have you ever listened to his stuff? I think he's crazy, you know, and uh, he, oh, he's off the reservation. And when analysts... Analysts, stock analysts were calling the CEO and say, Nick, what's going on with that uh, San Rocco Therapeutics? Is your product better than theirs? Yeah, San Rocco Therapeutics. We got them all locked up. Don't worry about it. So that's called insider trading. In the meanwhile, Nick Leshley makes over $100 million selling his stock, which goes up to $230 in 2018. Selling it, they raised $1.1 billion alone at 185 and 165 in 2018. Selling it to unsuspecting investors. All the while, they knew they had bum dope. That's insider trading. Hmm. Nick Leshley makes over $100 million. I told you, he was the, the best CEO in 2014 in bioscience, and he was the worst in 2020. They go behind my back. They make a deal. <clears throat> I don't know what they're doing, but I make a deal with the company I license it from, with the not-for-profit, and I say, okay, guys, you're not happy with me for whatever reason. I get it. Not a problem. I'll give you back the project, but run like hell with it. And I figured because they had 4% and 6% royalties, I figured if I give them 50% royalties, basically, they're going to go run like hell with it, which is basically what I did. Mm -hmm. I kept 50% of the product project for my investors, and they got 50%. But they ran the project from then on. In 2015, I went to them and I said, Bluebird Bio has treated 30 patients. We've treated three. What the hell is going on? I got an attorney. I found out that the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering had other issues. And through newspaper articles, New York Times, by the way, 2012, found out that the same guys that bought my competitor had funded Memorial Sloan Kettering CEO, his publicly traded company and he was sued for a billion dollars in 2012 because of that of course it all ends up you know settling out of court hold on a second you hear that is that Rafal is he here yeah he's here can you ask him to turn that down real quick <clears throat> just knock on the door right there just just crack it open real quick say, say yo we're about we're wrapping up we're wrapping up a podcast Sorry. Sorry, that's coming like through the microphone. I can hear it pretty loud in the headphones. He lit? All right, cool. Sorry. So basically <clears throat> in 2015, you know, I'm looking back and all of that, and I find out that the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering got like, you know, $110 million from the owners of my competitor. So now I'm getting a little bit nervous. From the owners of who? I told you that there was two French companies, basically, or two French researchers who invented one, the beta globin gene, and the other, the mutant beta globin right, gene. Right, right. The mutant beta globin gene gets bought by Bluebird Bios. Okay. Bluebird Bio was owned by Third Rock Ventures. 
Third Rock Ventures had given, had funded the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering's company, Ajo's Pharma, for $110 million between 2007 and 2011. Oh, okay. It's all in the book. Right. And again, I'm not disparaging Memorial Sloan Kettering. Great. I love them. They do a lot of great, great things for people and all of that. The executives, you know, whatever. They come and they go. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, I go to, you know, t- to my ex-partner and I say, hey, man, you got to give him my product back because, you know, you're, you're fumbling the ball here. And they say, no, no, we're not going to give it back to you. So I said, okay, I'll sue you for breach of contract. So I sue him for breach of contract. And we begun, begin discovery. By 2017, Christmas time, it was December 28th, I get to read the second amended complaint. You know, I think the worst thing in life, worse than cancer, worse than getting beat up, worse than discrimination, is disappointment, for me anyway. So, you know, it, it's like, son, the teacher said you cheated on your exam. That's horrible. But it's real horrible when you find out that he really did do it. It's disappointing. So I had suspicion that things weren't on the up and up, but there was no way in the world I thought anybody could ever put money in front of patients. I mean, it just didn't work. For, I'm stupid. I admit that I'm, I didn't graduate from high school. I, I'm stupid. And like I say, I'm one of those Catholic guys who like believes we're all brothers and likes wants to help everybody. And, and, and it, but in December, December 28, 2017, Judge Ostrager was our, our judge. He said, I'm going to blow this case wide open. And our case was in the New York Times front page. New, front page, New York Times. We had 40 articles. Bloomberg, you name it, did articles on us, you know. And he said, I'm going to blow this case wide open. I'm going to let the world see the amended complaint <clears throat> and what Girondi and San Rocco Therapeutics is accusing Bluebird Bayou and Third Rock Ventures of doing. I was laying in my bed in Italy. It was like 51 degrees in my house because going through the Going through the trial, I didn't have any liquidity. I was borrowing money from my partner, Joey Feldman. He had borrowed the company $3.5 million that he'd never get back if we lost the case. Um, my attorney, Ken Sussman, Jew from New York, I love him like a brother, he took out a second mortgage on his house because he was on contingency. So there was no way I was going to ask anybody for money. So my house, I didn't, I didn't turn on the heat. And that was it. It was 51 degrees. It was 51 degrees. And um, I was uh, in my bed when I got a call from my attorney, Ken. He says, I just sent you the amended complaint. The judge said you can read it all. Up until then, it was protected under secrecy. Mm. I couldn't read it. It was attorney's eyes only secrecy. I don't know what happened. But like I said, I wasn't crying like, (laughs) but I was disappointed. I suspected that maybe they could have done what they did. But nothing hit me like when I read that they did do it. They really put money in front of patients' lives. And I, 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 I laid in bed on my, my phone and I just read it. And I read all the charges. And the charges were the result of discovery that I couldn't see, but my, cur- my attorneys could. And all of a sudden, I'm reading the dates, the words, the documents that they, they used to fuck my son. He'd have been cured three or four years ago. And to fuck every one of his brothers and sisters who have sickle cell disease and thalassemia. They fucked every one of them. And I felt like the biggest piece of shit because I let him fuck him. Because I wasn't smart enough. When we started dancing in 2010, when they were blowing smoke up my ass about how I was the greatest father in the world, I didn't realize that those fucking fruit faggots from Harvard University and Yale were fucking me up my ass and at the same time fucking my patients. And in 2000, 
December 28, 2017, I was able to read it all. And I, there was nowhere in my house for me to hide. I felt like the, <clears throat> the, the, the biggest idiot. Just I let, because by then, every sickle cell disease patient is my son or my daughter or my brother or my sister, every thalassemic patient. And I had let them do that. And uh, after that, the judge said to them, you know, this isn't a frivolous case. By then, they had spent 30, 40, 50 million dollars fighting us. Up until then, it was me and my Jew attorney from New York, Ken Sussman. Me and him. Us two. And Joey Feldman, my partner. Banking us, paying for experts. Paying for the, you know, court, the discovery. I mean, it, it's just a nightmare. And, and that's why in the United States, unfortunately, most people can't afford justice. Mm. And uh, the judge finally, like in 2018, he told him, he says, you know, you're treating this as a frivolous case. It is not a frivolous case. But COVID came. <laughs> so what happened? Our court case, delayed, mm. delayed, delayed. And we didn't get in front of the judge until October 29th of 2020. And uh, the way he did it, he gave us four days. And because of COVID, you had to do it by Zoom. So we sent in all our affidavits. They sent in all their affidavits. The judge read all the affidavits. And then for the first two days, they got to kind of find holes in our armor and make us look like fools or make it look right. like we were lying. And uh, I was the first guy on the stand. And we were in Boston because it, in 2021, we hired Greenberg Trowrig, three guys, guys from uh, Massachusetts, and they had a bigger office than Ken's office in New York. So we went to Massachusetts for the case. And good guys, by the way. Um, so I was the first guy up, you know. And I was on the stand for an hour and a half. It was easy for me, Danny. All I had to do was tell the truth. Right. I mean, it, I didn't have to remember a goddamn thing. I just told the truth. And I got done. And then our president was on, Sam Selman. He never took a paycheck. I never took a paycheck. Sam Selman didn't even have a sick kid. I hired him in 2009. From 2009 to 2020, he never took a paycheck. I never took a I took my first paycheck when we settled the agreement when we settled the, the case in 2021 I took my first paycheck my, my my first paycheck you know and I'm taking a salary of 150,000 and when I saw that there was 19,000 on my credit card that should have been charged I wrote a check back to the company that's the kind of capitalist that we are or we were in the United States of America the first guy to sacrifice is the boss He's not the CEO making $34 million like Fold when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt with all those poor people's pensions and he got a golden parachute. Capitalism, that's not capitalism. That's criminalism. So anyway, I was the first up. Sammy was the second up. Greg LaPointe was the third guy up. He was the CEO of Sigma Tau. Great guy. And boy, they couldn't even ding us. Couldn't ding us. There was thousands of people watching the webcast kept getting interrupted and the guy on the webcast was saying your honor we, we can't you know the, the, we can't technically support the thing anymore i mean so many people are watching you know it was incredible and then we went the next day with our experts damage experts etc cetera, etc cetera. it was friday the judge said, okay monday and tuesday you guys are up at bat now my attorneys got to find the chinks in their armor and the judge ended the day, and he said, I don't know where you're going with this, Bluebird, Third Rock Ventures. This could be very painful for you. And then he looked at me. And it was weird because me, he didn't really know he was looking at me because it was a podcast. But he was looking at me, and he was looking into my heart. And he said, in the state of New York, damages are a slippery slope. And that was a message to me. So 
I went to my Aunt Gloria, 91 years old. She died right after the trial. Went to see her over the weekend and went to church and went to Mass and talked to my mother and talked to my friends and Joey. Sunday night, I get a call from Mark Berthium. Pat! Got to get on the phone! Why, Mark? It's fucking 10 o'clock. They want to settle! So, they want to settle. <laughs> they can talk to me tomorrow morning. I'm going to bed. Yeah, but come on. I mean, uh, this is what we're waiting for. Hey, Mark, I'll talk to you in the morning. I went there. <clears throat> they shuffled papers in front of me. They said, Drandy, because, of course, I'm the bad guy the whole time. I'm an idiot. I'm the high school dropout who was playing over his head. and um, You know, street guy. Father, good intention father, all that bullshit. Rock star in Italy and all this. And anyway. Uh, Gerondi, what will it take to end this? He said, well, what do you mean? Well, what do you need to make this stop? I said, well, I want my product back. And I want enough money to pay my attorneys, to pay my debt, and to have enough money to move forward and treat patients. That's what I want. How much will that be? I'm bound by secrecy, so I can't give you the number. It was in the millions, obviously. More than that, I can't say. My attorneys, if they're watching, and maybe they're not, maybe they are, they'll be cringing right now. They're probably getting ready to ball me out after the podcast, but I don't really care. I'm going to die soon anyway. I mean, how long do we live, you know? I mean, I'm just <laughs> doing what I'm supposed to do, you know? So I said, it's X amount of dollars, and give me my product back. And they said, done! If I had asked for double <laughs> what I asked for, they just said done. But I didn't need double. Mm. I said, just give me enough to get back on the road. And so that's what we're doing now. So... At the University of Kentucky, University of Southern Illinois, Chris Ballas, Daesh Govender, Professor Andrew Wilbur, Professor Frank Park. Um, we're putting an insulator on our product because Michelle Settlin at Sloan Kettering discovered that these lentiviral vectors, these gene therapy, need an insulator because there's been cases of leukemia and stuff for patients treated without an insulator. What's an insulator? An insulator is, so when the gene goes into your chromosome, lines it could fall next to a oncogene like a cancer gene and trigger it oh shit so we want to put an insulator huh? in between our <clears throat> gene that we're inserting our vector that we're inserting and the other gene so it won't trigger them yeah so we're doing that idea. now we're doing that now okay um but bluebird bio might be approved by then who we don't who don't know they're going to be in june 8th and june 9th there's going to be a public hearing that the fda is calling for bluebird bio we already sent in a uh, it's called a citizen's petition and we said to the FDA, FDA, we don't think they should be approved because, one, they have a mutant gene. Two, they've had problems with patients. Three, they don't have an insulator. Four, they butted in line and acted with treachery to get where they are. Mm. And th the fifth thing is something called orphan drug exclusivity because if they get orphan drug exclusivity, they won't have competition for seven years in the United States. So we said, FDA, we don't think you should allow them to be approved. But they might get approved. And I, that's not the fault of the ex FDA because it's not the FDA's you know, thing to be looking at court cases, by the way. Right. So, and they might get approved and, and, uh, and, and that's it. But that's how the court case ended basically. And we find out that Bluebird Bio is infringing on our product. So now we're su suing them for infringement. So maybe economically, it might be the best thing in the world that they get approved. Because then why? They're going to have to pay me because they're infringing mm. on my product. But we, we think that we need an insulator on our product. And uh, they, do, they need one as well, we believe. And I was just at the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy in Washington, D.C. for a week talking to, you know, all of the people at the FDA, all of the researchers, all of the whatever. I gave out about 30 of my books, you know. It was kind of neat um, and wonderful. But there's a lot of great people at the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, National Cancer Institute, FDA, SEC, FBI, 
politicians, you name it, we've got some of the best in the world. Doctors, CEOs even. We've got some great, wonderful CEOs. Emil Kakis, John Ballantyne, Michael Chambers, CEO of Aldebaran. And I'm talking about companies that are worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And they're great guys, by the way. Is this gene therapy going to be able to make it possible to where people with these blood diseases won't have to get transfusions? Yes, they'll be cured. They'll be asymptomatic. So you'll get the gene cell therapy essentially once, and then it's done? That's it. Done. Really? Done, man. Done. When do you, when do you uh, hope for this to happen? We're putting an insulator on now, and we're making sure, I mean, I'll be getting called by the end of the week probably, that the insulator is not hurting the efficacy of the drug. Okay. So, and show my book again. That's exciting. Hold it up. Hold it up for us. Tell right. tell people listening and watching. Light where, where their the, own where and I don't, care, I don't give a shit Hold about. Hold up. Up higher by your face. There I you don't go. give a shit about the money. I mean, the money's going to research anyway. But you know what? If you don't read it, you're not going to understand that this is true to what I'm saying. And it'll be great for you guys if you want to go to the stock market because it tells how I got in the stock market. It'll be great for you people if you got a sick father, a sick son, a sick daughter, a sick cousin because it tells all about that. And it'll be great for you people if you're like out of the box, not cookie cutter kind of people and you're wondering, geez, how could that guy get an Oprah Winfrey show? Twice. How is that guy one of America's most celebrable bachelors? How do you end up doing what it? Look, read about it. It's a great story. It's a feel-good story. And it's none of this bullshit, woe is me, my daddy beat me up, and oh, my uncle, he, he molested me. Oh, my God, I could never, ever see another hot dog in my life because every time I saw a hot dog, I thought of my uncle. I mean, come on with all that bullshit, will you? I mean, uh, come on. So, uh, you, we, we got to go back real quick before we end this thing. You're, sp you, you're in Playgirl. You didn't have a spread in Playgirl magazine, did you? Playgirl magazine. I had all my clothes on. Okay, good. You can go and find Thank it. Thank God. Okay, and I was in there with. If, if you were in there, Sylvester Stallone. I wanted, I wanted to have the signed copy to put on the bookshelf. I got know, it. But you know what? I, you know what? I'll, I, I'll send you a copy. But I was in there with Sylvester Stallone and Magic Johnson. By the way. Okay. Larry Johnson, Magic's brother, who I've yeah. collaborated with on sickle cell disease, by the way. Good people. So, I mean, it was kind of helpful that at least when I called, I said, hey, we were in the same magazine <laughs> together. You know what I'm saying? Uh, That's awesome. No, it is awesome. And, again, I, you know, again, I am, I am an idiot, okay? And I'm a high school dropout. And, 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 and I'm not the sharpest guy in the drawer. Um, but I try to be a, a good guy and a good American and a good capitalist, by the way. And... And as a good capitalist and a good American, with a socialist a Catholic, heart, with a socialist heart, I believe that the first guy to sacrifice should be the boss. Mm. You that's know, that's very well. That's uh, that's the truth. I, you know, I agree yeah, with that. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Bezos. You, you gotta know, lead for, by example. Yeah, forget about okay, how much is it worth a trillion? And a half, I, come on with all that bullshit. Give bonuses to all those freaking truck drivers. Take yeah, take ninety percent of all your money and give it away to your employees. Yeah. Let them get their health care. Let them get everything. I mean, you know, that's what a capitalism in America is about. Mm -hmm. It's not about dying with you know twenty zeros after your name. What good's that gonna do you? I agree. Pat, thank you for doing this. I very much appreciate it. Tell people where they can buy the book. So, Flight of the Rondoni. Oh, by the way, stop. I got to tell one more thing. Yeah. Why is it called Flight of the Rondoni? What is that? That's a bird. What is that bird called? Well, in English, you'd probably call it a swift. In Italian, you call it a rondone. Now, the Rondoni flies from Africa at about 140, up to 140 miles an hour. It gets into our town, and it lays eggs in our cathedral ceilings or roofs, roof. And um, it flies around and around. But the thing about the Rondoni is kind of like me. It's short. Don't have, and doesn't have a big nose like me, but <laughs> it's short. But it's got, like, real long, long wings. So it can't land on the ground because if it land on the ground, it can't take off again because the wings hit the ground when it tries to take off. Oh, okay. So it's always got to land two to three stories high, okay? And when they go in our piazza from like March to August, September, and they're flying around, flying around, flying around, flying, every now and then they collide because they go so fast, okay? <clears throat> when they collide, guess what happens? They fall to the ground. Well, when they get to the ground, we know what to do. We take them in our hands as gently as we can. 
We cup them and we throw them as high as we can into the air so that they can begin flapping their wings and take off. Well, when I was a kid, Big Mama, that wonderful dark-skinned woman from Northwestern Hospital, Clarence Bryant, that wonderful judge who told me to go to the military instead of jail, that wonderful dark-skinned man, Joey Gornick, that Croatian boss that I had when I loaded the trucks, my mother, my attorney, that Jew, Ken Sussman, who I love with all my heart. I, I kind of collided a lot. I wasn't too bright. I was that Rondone. And they picked me up and threw me in the air so I could fly again. It's beautiful. And I'm going to die soon. You know, we all are. You're not going to die soon. Well, like I mean, you look like a young, healthy what's, man. Yeah, but what's soon? I mean, I don't know, 50 years? It's pretty soon. I mean, <laughs> we've been on the planet 5 million years. So all I want to do is I'll raise some more money for my company. We're going to go after other therapies. We're working on a therapy, CD47 now, which is a great invention. Um, I want to try to do a little good. And we're not going to make the company a big company so we could, you know, give everybody a hundred million or whatever. No, no, no. We're going to try to do good research. And in the United States, we can do good research and it doesn't have to cost a trillion dollars because we're not going to let the executive steal all the money. It's a good plan. I hope, uh, I wish you all the success under the sun and, uh, it's exciting to see what you're doing, especially for people, for the patients that are suffering from sickle cell and those other blood diseases. Um, it's exciting shit, man. Yes, and remember, again, I don't care. I offended you. I mean, it's almost like tough shit, you know. I didn't mean to, but I did. But you know what? There's only one race, the human race. In the United States, the first thing I do if I was president, stop taking the goddamn census. Who cares how many of dark-skinned is, light-skinned is? This is all idiocracy. We're all Americans. <laughs> we just love each other. we got a great com country. We've got to get health care better. we got to get our universities better, and we got to help each other. That's it. Stop at all this division politics and all this bullshit. Yeah. Politics is for the birds. Not the Rondoni birds, but the... Not the Rondoni the birds. The shit birds. The shit birds. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you again, Pat. Love I you I very guys. much appreciate it. Thank you very much. And Goodbye, everyone. Fly to the Rondoni. Fly to the Rondoni. I'll you. link it below. Thank you.